The moment was these guys at St. George's um, released a song called Moochie, right? And this song, when it came out, I could not believe that people in Zim made this song. Yeah. It was just that good. <laughs> and Loki, if you play it even today, it's still kind of banned. It's still banned. And um, when I heard that song, it was like, if these guys can do it, so can I. Yeah. And so already from early on, it was already a thing of like, I want to compete globally. Because the first interaction of like, the pure inspiration was like, this song sounds global. Yeah. So we can compete with really? anyone all over yeah. the world, you know? So um, at that point, and uh, some of the guys who actually made the song are actually like big names now. Because if I'm not mistaken, it was actually produced by Maximus, who goes by Dr. Chai now. <laughs> Dr. Chai. That's fantastic. So it's like, so, so it's crazy that it's just like that's that piece of ins inspiration was um, was really propelled me forward. So what I did was like now I started like like really like actually beat making on a different level. I was like actually now I remember I, I sampled the song by um, One Republic. Yeah. So it's called uh, all my all the right moves in all the right places. You remember that? That's right. Yeah. yeah. So I sampled it, and I remember going to my boy and going like, "Nah, bro." I said, "I'm gonna win a Grammy." Like off of this, I'm gonna win a Grammy. I was really hyped, bro. And at the time, also, I was getting schooled into hip hop because um, at PE, one of my friends was a battle rapper, and he was like a very boom bap guy, and he really like gave me a uh, schooling into like hip-hop and rap and like what it means to rap to flow etc etc right and um a funny occurrence that happened because obviously i started off as a beat maker yeah was um i got introduced to first lil wayne and then um kanye yeah and when i found out that kanye makes his own beats and raps on them because I felt like it was an unspoken rule you can't rap like, on your yeah, own beats you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. and then I was like, like it was very clear it was very clear on producer this side, yeah, rappers, rappers, on, rappers this on this side and I was like oh Kanye does it so let me start doing it so I would start writing rhymes and then um, there's this time I remember in form 3 where some dude wanted to challenge uh, peeps in class to a rap battle Right? And I'd written my rhymes and I like I don't know, I just dropped them or something. Then he picked them up and was like, who wrote these rhymes? Yeah. And I was just so scared to put it out there that I, I just chickened out and I was just like, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but I'm gonna say it's garbage. Exactly. I was like, I thought like people are gonna cloud me, you yeah, know. Yeah. But then I remember going home and thinking to myself, I never wanna feel like that again. I never wanna cower in front of my art. Yeah. You know, like 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 <laughs> this is something I wrote. And uh, maybe to preface that was like in primary school, I used to write a lot. Like um, I won like competitions for writing. So yeah. for me, rap was like competitive writing. Just like, cause I was a sports yeah. person and then I could write on the side. So it was like combining the both and it was like, you can rap. So that's, it's a very competitive thing. It's a competitive thing. thing. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I so that was that. when it started around like I'll say form three, the form three going into form four. Yeah, I hear that. And yeah. and I and I and I love that. But we're gonna we're gonna jump. We're okay. gonna jump way back. I think we might come back in in some regards, but mm -hmm. um it's it it does tie into that career aspect of things mm -hmm. where so you've you've been in the industry for a number of years now, yeah. I think. The earliest interview I could find of you was maybe over like six years ago. <laughs> I was like, what? And it was like, and it was 240p. I was like, jeez. <laughs> I, I couldn't even watch it. I was just like listening yeah. to it in the background. I was like, man, I'm not hurting my eyes. Yeah, 240p, <laughs> man. Yeah. yeah. But um, one of the things you, you said in a separate interview, not that one, uh, yeah. was that uh, it's easier to actually make money offering services yeah. uh, to, to practitioners within the arts industry yeah. than actually being a practitioner yourself, right? Yeah. Um, what, do you, what did you mean by that? And, and does it actually still like hold true? Mm -hmm. um, I think 
uh, it really boils down to your relationship with money and how money was viewed when you were growing up and how you'd see the interactions with adults and stuff like that. You yeah. knew that I, I actually got that sense early on that, you know, ultimately I also have to make money from this. Yeah. You know, if I'm going to do this seriously, like I have to make money from it. So um, when I got into the industry, like, like proper, proper, it was like the first thing that you realize is like, okay, um, there's a lot of people who are trying to make it and there are a lot of people who profit off of people trying to make it yeah. because someone yeah. has to go to a studio, someone has to, you, to you know, record, yeah. you have to promote, exactly, to see, to see. Yeah. not in a nefarious way, but it's just, just how it is. So I was like, I, I went through those motions of having to go to the studio and I would always think to myself, like, you know, I make beats, yeah. um, this, I'm paying this guy like to, to make beats for me. You know, and at that time, and obviously it differs because also it, it has to come to you just to be something that you actually holds your attention and you're like, yeah. I'm actually a beat maker. So this is not to knock anyone who's like purely an artist. It was just for me, since I'd already started in that path, yeah. it was just like, look, let me just buy my own equipment because I didn't like the way the guys were mixing my stuff. And yeah. I was like, I was like, I just <laughs> need to buy. So I bought like, I remember, um, uh, with the help of their friend, uh, was they say George's, helped me like uh, get something on Amazon. I got a USB microphone um, with a pop filter, just a little stand, and I was like, "Yo, let's get to moving." You know, what I'm saying? <laughs> let's operate. Yeah. It's, it's in house now. It's in house. Yeah, the production is in house production because I was like, "Yo, bro, um, if I'm gonna turn this into a career, and if I want to scale it to the size that I want to scale it, yeah. we have to have a." Uh, income there has to be streams of income there has to be some sort of structure yeah. so the earliest form of structure was very basic create a, a customer based business based on production use that to fund the artist side yeah that was yeah. that was that was the game plan yeah and I, and I love it man because we don't talk about that context enough where um, it costs a lot to record man and <laughs> a lot in the sense that yeah. people start recording when they're around maybe let's say 18 yeah. on average right yeah and an 18 year old in zim man they usually don't have no money yeah, like, yeah. They are and yeah. And True. Then, True. so for them to actually have exposure to go and record uh let's say 10, 20, 30, 40 times to yeah. record like the bad songs and yeah. get those out of the way. Yeah. It's gonna cost them like a lot of money, right? Yeah. If, they're not, if they're not like owning some part of that like True. process, like you're saying, good yeah. I had to give services, yeah. make money, and then that allows me to, to, to actually record. Yeah. So I so I actually do uh, re respect that and I hear that. And I think that's what has essentially now turned into Nirvana Studios, yes. right? Yes. Um, so this allows you to record, mix, master, engineer, all that that whole process for, yeah. for other artists. Yeah. I think you also even offer like promotional services, promotional for, services for musicians, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, what's the overarching goal with the studio, given that you yourself are a recording artist as mm. well? Uh, is it still the same? This is just to fund my thing, mm. or it's become bigger than that? Um, you know, I come from a cloth where it's like I had to do everything myself. So at some point, I was my own videographer. At some yeah. point, I was my own graphic designer. Um, I had to pick up everything that I couldn't hire someone else to do. I would do yeah. it myself. So I produce. And at some point, there are even iterations of time where I used to charge like for like uh, graphic design. And um, even as far as like uh, creating like a... Uh, uh, a vlog, uh, a blog actually in 2015 yeah. using a Wix site and I would invite guest bloggers to come in and then I would just slip in like my tracks, my latest tracks and stuff like that in that. So the idea with Nirvana is like a condensation of all these years of, of what I learned yeah. and sort of helping um, artists like um, not really skip steps but I had to do it out of necessity. You know, but yeah. if I did have access to someone who knew this, it would make it, it way easier. Yeah. You know, so Nirvana is sort of like um, just by the name, it's like it's supposed to be a sanctuary. You know, because um, in college I studied psychology, right? Yeah. And um, 
funny enough, uh, uh, you know, sometimes I'll go back and forth with my parents and they'll be like, yo, this music thing, but you have a psych degree. And I'm like, nah, this is my form of psychology, you yeah. know, because these kids, when they come to record, they'll be telling me also in between the session, they're going like, I'm dealing with this at home. Yeah. You can hear it in their songs and stuff like yeah. that. So, <laughs> so that's where came the name like Nirvana. You know, it should be a place where you feel at peace, you feel a place where you can uh, express your creativity to the highest level, you know. And what does the highest level look like? It looks like monetization. So I have like five, I have a, like a, a principle called the five C's. This is like my core tenet under everything that I do, right? Yeah. So it's content, context, consistency, community, commerce, right? Those are the principles which yeah. you operate under that like on the first level we're, we have content, right? We're making the music, right? Mm -hmm. And we're making content about the content, right? We have behind the scenes stuff and stuff like that because yeah. context is so important, yeah. right? Here's <laughs> <laughs> here, yeah, right? This is context, right? Yeah, um, actually, actually, exactly. Right? That, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> right, so content, context is the, obviously the interviews and the context of where are we? Who are we trying to speak to? Who are we inviting into this world? Right, and very like really curating what that looks like, right? Cons yeah. Consistency now is like how often are you releasing the music? How uniform is it? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I think consistency, then community. Who are we speaking to? Uh, being very intentional about like, okay, who's the target market? And then commerce keeps it all together. You need yeah. to make money. Yeah. You know, okay, <laughs> it's I'll the only way you can keep <laughs> all of this going. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I hear that. So there's something you said: uh, context, uh, community, yeah. commerce, yeah. content. Yeah, which is the other one? Next uh, one. So it's content, context, community, uh, consistency, commerce. Ah, okay, yeah. okay. So in regards to community, target market. Um, yeah. For you, uh, because like you said, man, I was uh, w watching the rollout for your most recent album, and mm. it's it's. Super intentional. Uh, mm -hmm. The visuals, like the, the the visuals for the singles leading up to the album. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of like consistent themes, right? Mm -hmm. I won't touch on them. People mm -hmm. should go and do some homework <laughs> and then go and immerse themselves in the art. Yeah. Uh, but you even you even have like side visuals, right? Which mm -hmm. are not like music, but mm -hmm. context informing the music, right? Yeah. Uh, in terms of community. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel like you have been uh how does that work i i want mm. to understand like uh have you been speak have you did you and this is like such a hard question for me to word because yeah. i want to word it perfectly but mm. uh when looking at that did you sit down and you're like yeah exactly i have like mm. a perfect analogy mm. exactly so for if you're if you're starting a business right usually mm. what happens is you identify the customer and yeah, give them yeah. like char characteristics. You're like yeah. uh, men between ages 18 and 25. Yeah. They like A, B, C, and D, and mm -hmm. there's like an intersection between our brands. Is that what you've done for yourself, or does mm -hmm. that like evolve over time? Because you're a storyteller, so yeah. maybe a different story is catered to different people. How does mm -hmm. that work for you? Um, for me, uh, community is sort of like. Uh, in the most basic sense, it's like the communities I'm a part of and the yeah. communities I speak to. So those are the two layers I deal with. Yeah. So the communities I'm a part of is like the strategic partnerships, um, the peers, um, the media, yeah. you know, uh, agencies. You. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and really understanding the exchange of value, you know, yeah. um, uh, value propositions, just like going like, okay, how can this make us both win? You know, and um, that's 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 really on that layer. Then the next layer is like who I speak to. So I call like um, my fans, my tribe, my army, yeah. the law enforcement, right? And it's literally just started off as this idea of um, I, I performed at a TED talk, right? TEDx Harare. Yeah. This was in 2018, and one of the speakers talked about how WhatsApp has such a wide reach. Right. And people aren't like even like it's, it's like so easy for someone to get WhatsApp messages rather than go to YouTube or something like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So in our context, in our context you know, <laughs> so um, I created a WhatsApp group. Right. And this was just like because my numbers were so small, 
um, I could identify the people who support me the most. And what I wanted to do was, was recreate the feeling of when you go to a concert. So for example, let's say we go to a J. Cole concert. If you're a J. Cole fan and I'm yeah. a J. Cole fan, if we're at the concert, at the very least, we feel like everyone around us has the same values. You're amongst family. Yeah. So now I was like, let me create a WhatsApp group so that Six The Law fans can like just be in the same space and slowly grow this out. Yeah. You know, if they get like special content, they get things first, they get like um, um, just a behind the scenes look and stuff like that. So for me, that's what has like really propelled me as well because like I feel like I'm not one of the artists who's been really super embraced like mainstream. Yeah, um, I hear that. And uh, it's just understanding like okay, what does that niche look like? And at some point, it's like uh, I like what someone said, uh, and I'm gonna paraphrase it. It's like um, I'm not gonna go mainstream. Mainstream is gonna go six the law. Yeah. I yeah, yeah. I, I, I look at like artists like Tyler the Creator or like uh, you know even uh, Casper New Fest uh, and A Reese, you know, where it's like you have a tribe that's so big that you can't help but be mainstream. Yeah, you know? like <laughs> man, especially with A Reese, bro. Like, bro, his people are his people. Yeah, man. jeez, man, they bro. love him to death. Yeah, I hear that, man. I, I hear that. And uh, the next thing we'll move on to is. Mm -hmm. um, NFTs, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. because that has been an interesting thing, and I think it touches on the other C, which is com co commerce or mm -hmm. commercialization, right? Mm -hmm. And deeply invested in that, mm -hmm. uh, you've released music, uh, you've co-founded a platform within that Web three space. Mm -hmm. um, what's drawn you mm -hmm. to NFTs? Uh, and uh, since joining that movement, how has that been going? Okay, so you know the cool thing about my NFT journey is that it's just really necessity is the you know father of all the invention, right? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to get more income. It was just literally a monetization play initially. Yeah. It was just like what is a better way that's beyond the realm or the scope of like DSPs yeah. to make money and it really started as simple as like I have a friend who's heavily into crypto and he would always post these charts and stuff on his WhatsApp status and I'm mm. like hey come dad what, what are these bro what, what's this what's this matrix you know what's this matrix you're in <laughs> then he kind of gave me like I would say like 15 links and it was just like watch all these videos and then like you can start your journey on yeah. this so i'm watching all these videos and i like just the whole idea and the mentality behind cryptocurrency because it's such a like uh we let's do it on our own let's not depend on these systems which are flawed yeah. and they have so much red tape you know and upon that that's when uh nfts were now starting to bubble and one of my favorite youtube channels um, that I would always watch for tutorials. The guy was talking about NFTs. I was like, oh, this is interesting. I've been studying about cryptocurrency. Let's yeah. see what NFTs are. What's the link? So as I, as I found out about NFTs, it was like, oh, okay. So I can sell my song um, as like a digital asset, like the same way you'd sell an art piece. Yeah. You know, and this is a different um, sort of mentality from just the streaming era where like ultimately we're driving traffic to Spotify, you know, and they're yep. making all the money. And then you get like a, exactly. a piece of a the piece pie, of the pie the East, you know. This is now someone who's a collector who views your work. So instead of selling it as like um, all these infinite number of copies, you can sell like a one of one song. You can sell like yeah. three copies of a song, yeah. you know. So um, what happened was like uh, as I got excited about this my major issue was like I didn't have cryptocurrency right because yeah. to create NFTs you need cryptocurrency and um, I remember at that point um, uh, Indigo Saint um, yeah. amazing rapper brilliant, from Blaue, brilliant guy. Yeah. Um, was <laughs> also on, sort of on the same wavelength I think we we're concurrently just looking into alternative ways of monetization and he stumbled upon um, this 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 uh, blockchain called uh, Phantasma, 
and basically what they were doing is giving artists a starting amount of crypto to create their first NFTs. Yeah. And because I saw him post like, yo, I'm selling an NFT immediately. Yeah, like, the DMs, I was like, bro, how do you do this? Then he, um, he actually um, gave me the, the, the plug and we actually just started um, selling the NFT. So my first NFT that I ever sold was, um, it was for a song called uh, Hope. And it was, I sold it for 70 USD, yeah. right? uh, equivalent in crypto. Yeah. Um, of which that was more money than I have ever made. Stream like streaming. You see. <laughs> so it's just like made in instant financial sense. It was just like, okay, sold the next one for 150, you know, yeah. a single copy of a song, then the third one like for, for 60 bucks. But then, in any, because I'm such a like a researcher type person and a scientist with this, I need to understand why someone would buy an NFT. So part yeah. of the first amount I made from NFTs, I actually bought NFTs so that I understood. Ah, you like okay, yeah. let's... Let me see how how this actually works. And then I spent the next couple of months um, establishing myself in the community um, of. Um, of the NFT community and just learning from people who've been doing crypto even way before, yeah. you know. And that sort of like uh, got me into spaces where um, eventually when like a Julio pops up and he's doing stuff for Drake, yeah. um, we, at that point we had like a, we still have a podcast, we're on a hiatus, <laughs> uh, artist to artist. We did a space and um, Julio was our guest. Yeah. And then that sort of set off a chain reaction where like people were actually now like uh, got we got the opportunity to even talk to members of parliament uh, for like crypto adoption in Zimbabwe and I was I came Ooh, there interesting. <laughs> talking about NFTs and stuff and then talk to like that's when the snowballed into like just getting invited to different um, you know conferences and then we got covered by um, rest of world which is big yeah, tech is brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. They're like really good writers. Yeah. I read them from time to time. Yeah. They we they went and got featured in the rest of the world. Um, it was just like, oh, this is a thing thing, you know? <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think I think yeah, before I ramble on. No, no, I hear it, man. I hear it. That's yeah. that's what drew you yeah. to to and so and so what I would ask, right, as, as a follow-up to that is mm. uh you mentioned a good thing in that uh there really was like a time where NFTs were a bubble where yeah like where you my opportunities yeah. like where like yeah. even people who have like um no true incentive. Yeah. yeah, I think the people who were making like maybe two thousand images, yeah. like people who aren't artists, yeah, but Raona yeah, like came to the table. Yeah. Um, how has that gone since? Because now, like the hype has, yeah, has sort of died fizzled. down. Yeah. And the and the good thing about hype dying down is usually it, it separates like uh, people who are in the trenches from like people who yeah. are like. Or to the gold process, exactly. right? Essentially. Yeah. Essentially. So what's what's happened since like uh is are these opportunities still there yeah. and, and, and in terms of like community and whatnot, yeah. Where's the NFT got story gone since? Since yeah. That's a that's such a beautiful question because like uh the thing about me is that like sometimes um I can like kind of predict where things are gonna go. Yeah. Right. And I guess maybe that's the psychologist in me, uh where it's just like um, with groupthink, there's hype cycles, yeah. you know, and you know that, okay, this hype cycle, what is the underlying, there's always like, what is the underlying um, tangible thing be, be beneath this? So that's what I invested in. So I invested in that by um, creating genuine connections with people around the world, right, through yeah. this NFT space. Yeah, I hear that. Right? And, um, what that does is no matter what the weather is, when you're with serious people, you're going to be doing serious things. Yeah. You know what I'm <laughs> um, So I could see that this is a gold rush, you know. Um, a lot of people made a lot of money. A big yeah, like life changing <laughs> life changing money, money, you know. <laughs> and I kind of wish I, would, I had more liquidity at that time. Because I would have made like a whole lot of money, but like it, 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 it served its own purpose. And then the second thing is like, I like to have real estate in things that I'm involved in. Yeah. So it's like, with music, I have a studio, you know, like, it's a staple. It's like a place where energy, it's like a nexus point, you know? Yeah. So that actually 
what led us into, I guess we're going to talk about that, like uh, us creating a platform. Because yeah. we saw beyond like this being used for just artists and stuff like that. There's actually use cases um, in, in so many fields, yeah. you know, for, for, for NFTs. So that's the approach uh, which we took. And we already knew, we're already having these conversations that at some point it's only going to be the serious projects which are going to be left. Yeah, All this like the real building. Exactly. All the, the, the rest of the bubble is just going to burst. And a lot of people also, they came in with the wrong intentionality. With your most recent project, mm -hmm. uh, and I guess this touches on, on things we've already explored, even mm -hmm. with NFTs, right? Uh, one of the things you did was early access release where people could buy the album, mm -hmm. uh, A Boy in a Blanket, mm -hmm. um, before it actually went to DSPs, the digital streaming platforms. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that's a recurring thing, and, mm -hmm. and, and maybe you've answered it to. To, to, to the dot before, but it mm. seems to me that it's very important for you to do extra work mm -hmm. to distribute music outside of these platforms, the yeah. digital streaming platforms. Yeah. Uh, why is it like so important for you, like as an artist? Um, I was on a panel last year. It was a DSTV panel, it was yeah. an anti-piracy panel. Yeah. And uh, basically they had a bunch of speakers, some from music, some from literature. And um, we're just talking about like battling piracy, right? So there were some um, good points. Then there were some like antiquated ideas where yeah. it's like let's 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 uh, uh, go like really um, put the hammer down on people selling CDs in yeah. town. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like CDs. like CDs, like laptops ain't even playing CDs. <laughs> You know exactly. Yeah. So I kind of got into Kanye-esque zone with where I was like on a rant and I'm like, yo, like before you, you need to understand like where the world is right now. Like yeah. you have to find ways to compare to a Gujara and Net Niger. We're feeding the streets. You know what I'm saying? So I've always been a fan of like um, things that feed the streets because um, if you see even the biggest genres, right? Even yeah. whether it's hip hop or let's go to ama piano afro yeah. beat it was whatsapp it was audio WhatsApp. yeah all of it you know what I'm give it to the people give it to the people type thing so um my thinking is like a, a big thing that i that i prioritize especially in this time that we have so much content coming out because we're not we're no longer competing with it's no longer Six the law versus the next rapper. Yeah, it's not music versus exactly. music. Exactly. It's not like it's not like music versus TikTok. It's like everything, that time. Man. Like everything. Exactly. Like, like if, if Drake is dropping, if there's this new show, like you're now competing for attention. Exactly. You know? So exactly. what That's happens? Exactly what's happening. So what happens in that in that sphere is like accessibility becomes super important. Because if you act like you're super niche and stuff like that, you can easily get swept over. You know, so 100%. So it was important for me to think of one, the person who just loves Six the Law music and wants to part ways with money. Because people are actually hitting me up and going, like, Bro, I want to buy your album. So you have to give people that opportunity. That you know yeah. what I'm saying? And then you have to think about like the people who are native to Spotify and Apple Music, but the people also for Casa, you know, yeah. because they're extremely important. So you will see even on my on my download list there on on the link I'm pushing, you have Spotify there, you have your Apple Music, then yeah. you have a free download link. Yeah. Oh saying. snap! I, I, I never checked that. That's actually crazy. <laughs> you have a free download link because like um, if I want no, more people to know about me and what I do, they have to live their lives to my music. Yeah. They can't like use the last data which they have. This data is rationed between Drake. And, and Ice Spice the law, and the Six Below and like TikTok, you know. <laughs> so it's like if they have that direct download, it actually gets into the streets and it's more exciting because now yeah. it's moving through Share It, it's moving through this. And when I announce a show, if I'm going to do merch, yeah. you know, people then can part ways. That you know? attachment is there. That yeah, attachment is there. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 I love I love a couple of things you said there. Like one attention economy. I think. Uh, a lot of creators uh, fail to understand that. It's like this interview right now, if someone is watching it and mm -hmm. a WhatsApp message goes in, mm -hmm. we're competing with WhatsApp because What's it's it? taking them out of uh, you see this now. interview. Right? Yeah. And, and that affects us. Yeah. The last thing I'll ask you um, is 
about our industry generally. You, yeah. uh, the beauty of being six the law is that you have a two pronged view of the industry. Yeah. You have a view of the industry as a recording artist who puts music out mm -hmm. and uh, distributes music. You want to see how it's touching people, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. And then you have uh, the ability, or at least the view of a producer, a guy who interfaces with other artists within our industry, they come to you mm -hmm. for, like we said, promo, recording, mixing, mastering. Mm -hmm. um, what do you want to see more of in the Zimbabwean music industry? Um, I think I want to see more intentionality, you know. I feel like um some people are just reacting like fight or flight and it's like really that almost similar to the nft bubble yeah where it's like this is the sound that's working let's go with that let's go you know let's, let's jump on it let's jump on this you know and uh funny enough i did, like yesterday there was an interesting space about where people were talking Ooh, yeah. about <laughs> the hip hop, <laughs> the hip -hop space you know <laughs> um it's like a lot of interesting takes were yeah. you know given there yeah and i feel like <laughs> Ultimately, um, it boils down to like your mentality. I view the world as like there's inter-house athletics and there's the Olympics. You can be the fastest person at your house at your school. Yeah. We'll forget that as soon as we leave high school. Yeah. If you win, an, if you win an Olympic medal, like you, you're in history. So it's all about are you willing to compete on the highest level of this thing? It's an intentionality thing. Like, let's put aside environment, opportunity, and stuff. Because yeah. right now, as long as we've got an internet connection, bro, like, you it's can up. operate. It's, it's up, up, you know? So, <laughs> it's like, if you are viewing it as a cash grab, or, like, just you want clout, or yeah. you just want uh, to get pretty girls, or yeah. that type of thing, or it's like um, a way to do, like, uh, I don't know, scandal, whatever it is, like you just have to be i feel like the industry just needs a higher quality of of artists not to say that they they don't exist yes. there's actually a lot of high quality artists coming from zim but then it just needs to become a staple where it's like um like we've got a lineup and we know that these are internationally competent acts because yes. we're now a global village gone are the days yeah. of where you had to like just cater to um like the person in your hood or in your city or you know in your in your country you know like right now if you, my music is on spotify Drake's music is on spotify yeah. whiskey is on spotify you know like you have to compete you have to yeah. compete on that yeah. level so i feel like the intentionality to compete to want to compete and not be comfortable and just like make stuff that's not necessarily subpar but not the best version of what it could be you know, because like I don't see Zimbabwe on the list of um, when they put top MCs, but we do have top MCs. Yeah, you can go have, against yeah, yeah. against anyone out there. You know. Yeah. So <laughs> so, so it's just the, the 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 more intentionality behind the moves. You know, if you're dropping an album, please can the songs match the artwork, match the concept, match the rollout, yeah. match the set design. You know, yeah, like yeah, let's not true. just let's not just have a backtrack and just like people hype because now the thing is, right, the danger with it is that when the taste level of the generation is so low, when quality comes it can be perceived as whack. Because people yeah. are just so used to mediocre yeah. that they don't even know that no, there's an actual difference between like when someone is actually doing this, you know, let's put clout aside, likes aside, views aside, let's go on a quality level, you know, like, what are you being given, you know?